the agenda is posted online. Um, in the new system, it may have been missing our one other business item. Do that. Um, all communications may have been posted, correct? Yes. Um, minutes, the board has had a chance to review the minutes from the last meeting. Um, and then the first item up on the agenda is our consent agenda, and that's 55 South Gothic Street. Do we have the answer here? Can you tell us your name? My name is Claudia Raven, and I work as an associate planner at Planning Design and Construction. Great. And have you had a chance to review the staff report? I have. Um, do you have any concerns with that or any of the requirements? We agree to everything. Okay, great. So this was recommended for consent. If there's no one from the public here to speak, um, then we would be able to move forward. Um, is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this item, which is 55 South Prospect Street? Anyone in all those in favor? Thank you very much. Um, the next item on our agenda is E-23-273-41 Adams Street. Well, that was quite the first item. <laughs> very short agenda today. Um, do we have anyone else here to please on this item? Uh, so uh, and you find it now. Okay. Um, and sorry, there's no one. No, your hands are raised online. Um, so if you're going to speak on this matter, I'll just swear you in. Um, you raise your right hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the name of perjury. I do. Okay. You probably won't hear it from me, but I do anyway. Okay. Um, do you want to give us an overview of the project and then we'll jump into any questions? Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Dan Goldsman. I'm the architect of record uh, for this proposal. I'm also the owner of the uh, project. Uh, this is Joe Engelke, my partner. Uh, 41 Adams Street, currently a vacant lot. Uh, 0.1 acres, roughly 60 feet wide by 136 feet deep. Uh, we're proposing roughly 40% lot coverage. We're proposing a three unit uh, townhouse style building, uh, roughly 1900 square foot uh, building footprint, uh, roughly 5,700 square foot built total. Each one of the units roughly 1900 square feet. Uh, they also each have a roughly 300 square foot patio at the ground level and a 200 square foot uh, roof deck at the top. There's also a uh, pressure treated wood exterior staircase that's accessing all the lines. Uh, the first level, uh, two car garage, mechanical storage space. The second level, uh, kitchen, living, uh, bedroom, powder room. And on the third level, two bedrooms, uh, bathroom, laundry, and the roof decks up on uh, the roof. Uh, we're proposing uh, fiber cement uh, clapboard siding uh, throughout, smaller reveal, typical, and on those bump outs on the street facing facade, uh, a larger reveal. Uh, and uh, as a result of the comments at the DAB, we've added a bunch of windows on eastern and western uh, side facades to sort of enliven and those facades a bit. Um, at the ground level, uh, there's a small overhang uh, in, in front of the, the entrance to the building. There'll be a, a recessed light fixture over the uh, doors, uh, unit entry doors. 
Uh, we are proposing a little bit of wood siding there between the door, the uh, entry doors and the garage doors, just where people might uh, touch the building. You'd have it a bit nicer. Uh, obviously, each unit has an entry door and a garage door. Uh, the garbage will be in a trash enclosure at the eastern edge of the driveway on the uphill side. Uh, there's space for, for three garbage cans there. So we're proposing the garbage there and the recycling to be kept uh, inside. Uh, regarding the driveway, uh, we would have loved to have done uh, three uh, driveways, but having three curb cuts was a, a non-starter with the city. So uh, DPW would lead to the 14 foot wide uh, curb cut and it, that, that drive accesses all three units. Uh, we settled on this scheme after trying many others, but the site simply wasn't wide enough to have the building and an access road to park at the rear. So uh, we tried having the building oriented to the side, but then the street front would have been the side of the building. Uh, none of it really worked, so this is uh, where we ended up. Uh, the slope is also a big factor. Um, the one side of the driveway, the eastern side, has uphill retaining uh, where the trash enclosure is. And the other side, the western side, has downhill retaining. So that wall actually sort of acts as a railing to prevent falls there. Um, so as a result of the uh, of verbiage in the ordinance and comments at the DAB, uh, we worked with the uh, zoning staff uh, to come up with a scheme to break up the width of the driveway, which uh, was in, which is in violation of the uh, letter of the ordinance. It was too wide. So that's why we implemented these uh, walkways with curbs and pavers. So now that driveway is broken up and there are distinct uh, pedestrian and vehicle uh, entrances uh, to the building. At uh, the rear of the building, there's a light over the exterior door. There's a small uh, area with hardscape pavers. There's high uh, shadow box fencing to provide uh, privacy between the different units. Uh, the, there's no fencing toward the rear yard. It's open there. That rear yard will be a shared amenity. And there's also some stormwater infrastructure at the back of that uh, rear yard. Uh, we are proposing to use uh, cold climate air source heat pumps for heat and AC, so there will be condensers on the roof that we screen with a uh, shadow box fence set up there. And just finally, uh, the bulk of the building is, is meant to fit in the, into the scale of the adjacent structures. And while the overall building kind of reads its one large mass, which is a more of a sort of commercial gesture, uh, it is broken up with these sloped roof elements. Uh, reference the adjacent uh, residential structures. So the idea was to fit it into the neighborhood, but also announce itself as a new building. Any questions from the board? Yeah, so uh, sheet A100, which I believe is the third sheet, the level one, it, it identifies paved asphalt areas, and I think it's one up. Yeah, on the right, on the top, it identifies paved asphalt areas. That is not the final plan. Is that, right? that, that is correct. We went through a bunch of different iterations uh, to try and get to something that the ordinance and staff and um, the sort of needs of the project would, would come to. And at one point, uh, it, there was a strip of paving uh, going left to right across that page. And ultimately, where we landed was the three walkways with the curbs and and the uh, and, and 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 there are those kind of quarter circle blocks. Okay, yeah. Looking at that, it, it seems like it's nice when sidewalks go when entries the house go to the sidewalk, and you're not having to walk on the driveway to get to the front door. Any reason not to bring them, at least the out two outside ones to the sidewalk? I'm not sure that we would have been allowed to do that per the letter of the ordinance. Sure. I'd be happy to do that. I mean, absolutely. I so see. the outside two could extend the, the, the sidewalk. sidewalk. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, no, I understand because you're coming through the driving that made that cross thing sort of actually sort of nice, but at least the two outside ones going to the sidewalk would be uh so that people can walk to yes, we would be happy. They could also edge the pavement. You can sort of skirt around. Yeah, either one would be amenable to. As I said, we we would love to just have three straight shots, but uh, yes, driveway did it for me. And you made an application a few months ago. I think it was an appeal about um, parking areas in front of the house. Um, is there any? I guess this is for staff. Are there any concerns with that in the setup? I know these are. Lead up into parking garage. There's tandem spaces in the garage, right? So two spaces yeah. for you. Whereas that's that's a parking. Even though is there really a parking requirement here? Anymore? No, not parking requirement. I guess it was not sort of parking requirement, more about the parking in front of. Actually, parking or on the pavement rather than in the garage. Yeah. As long as you, yeah, you don't have to point there. Yeah, that's the issue. Okay, it's already exceeded every time. If anybody knows on that street, both sides are covered and you can't get emergency vehicles through. Sometimes you can never get to us by it. Your name and address, please. Sorry, Mark, the secret. I'm happy to talk anytime, but I wanted to wait to hear whatever the next one first. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind waiting for any. I'm glad to do that. What's your question? Generally, parking on the driveway that leads to the garage is acceptable as long as there's not access parking in front. So, because this driveway is intended to primarily provide access to the driveways, there could be parking potentially. But they don't solely exist for parking. Well, yeah, that's exactly that the Next. Trying to understand the roof a little bit more. Each unit has its own terrace up on the roof. Correct. And what's, and there's fencing around the terrace, each terrace. Correct. Yet there's some area that's higher than the fencing, and I can't tell what that is because it shows on the side elevation, but not yeah, the center true. elevation. So if you go to the, uh, yeah, to that floor, uh, the, so the floor plan on the left there. Yeah. Uh, these sort of shaded areas are uh, will have um, sort of track stacking or, or something. Yeah. Uh, there's boxes with squares in them. Those are enclosures for the mechanical equipment. So the idea is you'll be on the exterior <laughs> stairs and they'll travel up to the to the shaded areas where the uh, and, and those will be the root terraces. Go the elevation for a second. Okay, there. So on the left, above the railing there, there's some shaded area. What is that? Uh, uh, the idea is to have shadow box fence to five or six feet to provide separation when you're on your okay. deck from your neighbor. It's between some of the decks. Uh, between the decks. So okay. you're not sort of right on top. So, yeah. Right, right, right on, on the south view there, right under the phone line, PNC, you should be able to very slightly see. Yeah, right on the top right there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, can you explain that again? That it's on the roof. Sorry, can we just wait while your comment comes out? I open it up too. Staying on on that sheet is uh, the window is perhaps could could have a bit more rhythm. I was also. Wondering about on the the north elevation on the first floor, three of those windows are, are smaller than the other ones, and uh, I guess on east and west there's some inconsistency. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the idea with this project is it's a townhouse style project, which is more of a, of a dense urban type topology. Often you're slotted in there and you only have opportunities for windows in the front and the back. Uh, so, so 
you have your living rooms and bedrooms, and all the junk is in between kitchens and bathrooms where where the windows don't necessarily work. So initially, uh, on the top uh, the left, for example, I only had those two windows, which are connected by that trim in the middle, uh, because everything else was kind of, you know, they asked for more windows. So I sort of put them in the living room uh, to the left and in the bedrooms to the right. Now, the layouts don't lend itself to having windows in there. Uh, but I added them because you know that that's fine. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't it doesn't lay out sort of symmetrically and, and nicely and, and usefully. That's how it ended up. The the windows on the north elevation that are that are shorter than the other ones. That that's so in the back there on the top right. Uh, the bottom right on the first floor, sort of the ends and the middle. Oh. Yeah, so um, the the idea on the bottom right is above the garages on the second floor. Uh, those that's the living room. So I, I I made the windows as big as possible. I made the windows as big as possible. Above them is is a bedroom. Uh, they're a bit smaller. Above the doors, that strip there is sort of circulation space. So that's that's sort of how. It Any other questions? I just wanted to point out one thing on the uh, back to the rooftop terrace with the, the fencing or the railings that go around and the wire fence, which is, it probably doesn't fall within in the ordinance anyway, but it's fun to give you a heads up that there, even though it, there's the spaces between each one of those wires is, is correct, it's probably four inches, um, but it's, it's situated so that. Um, a toddler could climb that fence. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to give you a heads up on it. Maybe you want to make let people know that or tell them what alternatives they can have if you get it something that there's a tenant to that. Yeah, that, that is a good point. We'll, we'll provide a code compliant fence and through the, the, the building permit process will make everything you know, safe and you know. Any other questions? It's not really a question. I mean, you know, we don't really have a review of the plans. It is, it, it's nice that you have the roof deck and you have the terrace down below, but the access is really through one of the bedrooms. Yes. So somewhat unfortunate. I understand the challenge. I mean, you got a lot, a lot squeezed into the site. That you know, seems good. Um, I'm also not quite sure whether your um, gables will be, how visible or effective they're going to be added to the street scheme. I know it's to that time. And how would you join with colors with that or, or with the same color? Do you have the 3D image? Uh, oh, I can. Yeah. Uh, the, the board has never seen the. No. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's <laughs> oh, Holy Hopefully, it's the newest one. It's no, well, that's, that's an old one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it, it looks very dark here, but. Uh, oh. So everything be the same color, so attention. <laughs> Pardon, everything be the same color, all the siding. Uh, well, bl black windows, everything the same siding, and uh, three different colored entry doors. But uh, to be honest, we haven't decided on, on the, the color. This isn't. Potentially the final, final colors. Um, I know there was some public comment if you wanted to come up. Yeah, I'm sorry. So just before you speak, yeah, you can just say your name again, where you live, um, and I'll I'll swear you. You and Suzanne again, um, just to draft your comments and questions to the board, and then we'll give the applicants a chance to respond if they so choose. Okay. Um, so if anyone else wants to speak, if you raise your right hand, you can 
can swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pain of perjury. Is this where? Um, could be in there too, but I don't know if I'm ready to speak. It's okay. But I swear. Go ahead. And so I'm Martha Seagrave, my address is 8 Elm Terrace, um, and of significance, my backyard, my bedroom backs up to this. Um, and um, first of all, I want to thank you folks for inviting us. I would love to know where this is in the process, because this is the very first that anybody on our street or our colleagues and friends um, on Adam Street heard about this going and so we need to know where this is and what what possible chances we have to speak about it because um, we were all blindsided by this. Also, a summer meeting. I was on vacation. I get a, a, my neighbor had to tell me that this is going to happen. Um, this meeting was going to happen, and so we quickly, I mean, as much as we could, mobilize. I contacted this morning. Tried to contact my colleagues on Adam Street to come and join me. Who were also quite disturbed that they were we had no idea that this was happening. So I want to, I'm really grateful that we were invited today. Um, and so I want to thank you for that, but I did feel we feel kind of one sided. Um, that was so I would say a zoning permit is a barrier in the process. No, well, this is, this is the decision <laughs> step here. Yeah, this is it. I mean, this is. The short process it, it meets the well, criteria I mean, in terms of being built. Oh, yeah, but in terms of permitting and review, yeah. this is pretty much it. Um, only was it uh, staff reported meets the basic criteria of the zoning ordinance. Okay, so um, I have a number of questions and then I do have some comments. One of the questions I have is that when you were talking about the height, you mentioned that the highest point. In the building, did that include that fencing and the roof deck, and how high up that would go? Please direct your questions so to the board. I'm sorry. Not to yeah, just need to know whether or not. Sorry about that. I have never. I have not. Yeah, no worries. You should go through all of your medical fields and world are fine, but other way, you know, no, no, no. We'll take all of your comments. Anyone else okay. in the public? Okay. Fantastic. So one of the questions that I have is is about that height. Um, it is a significant, it will be a major change for those of us on Elm Terrace in terms of light, in terms of the, um, of the well, actually my neighbor has a view of Church Street, which will be cool this year. I know that that probably doesn't mean anything to anybody, but those are some of the things that have been really important to us, is for us to have the light and to have the, um, and to be able to sort of, you know, kind of, it's a major change, it's a huge change. Um, the other um, questions I had is, um, is just to make sure that the sidewalks, adding those additional sidewalks that you're talking about, whether that increases the lot coverage to the point that that's going to be a problem. We have a real problem with runoff on that area. So Adams, that, that building, and help me, this is where my neighbor's going to be able to help us, but that was a big farmhouse. It was a huge farm. And... Um, we were actually, Ellen Terrace was kind of the dump for that for a long time. And also there were multiple ravines that ran. I, I understand this from another person that I spoke with about this, um, who's a lawyer, a, a real estate lawyer, that there were ravines that really ran, ran through the whole area and they got diverted or moved with project building. Every single house on the side, our side of Ellen Terrace as a result of the construction that occurred, uh, I mean, or, or the, um, the use of it as a farm, has had to have their foundations redone. Um, and that it was um, it, that at major expense. In addition, there have been other things whenever something has happened that a, um, we needed to dig up the land, put in a culvert, and then recover it because we are getting flooded again. Um, I know that there's this stormwater area, but this is an enormous building. Nothing like this has gone into that area for many, many years. And so I have major concerns with this little stormwater area that you're, and also the construction piece, and then the fact that there's not going to be that land to absorb it, that we're going to be really in a bad, bad place in terms of water runoff and having it now flood us and affect our basement, our uh, foundations again. So um, that's something that I would like to have somebody look back at the 
historical mapping of the rivers or where things have gone through the city and make sure that this is, and, and just be acknowledged that that is a major issue that we've all dealt with for a long time. So that's that's one of our, um, the things that I'm, I'm very worried about. Um, what are the conditions of approval that you know, need to really store water with the okay. DW? That's not our okay, DW so that's, has to review it. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'm, you know, that's, that's that's we're, part really, of it we're kind of green yeah, on these yeah. things. And so I'm just, I, you know, since this is a chance for us to be able to express the concerns that we have. The jargon is that the be yeah. post construction, pre construction, both flow off the property should be about the same. Okay. So if there's a problem now, yeah, they're not may not fix it, but they shouldn't be making We are good at that. We're not really good now. Well, and that's what makes us very yeah. nervous. Is that the last house to I think it's the last house on the street finally got their foundation redone. Um the other concerns that I have is that they mentioned specifically that there was not, I mean, I'm not sure why we have to have a deck and patios. I love it. I mean, sure it would be really nice for the people, but that rooftop um, really is, we have already have noise issues. In fact, there've been noise, a lot of noise violations already from the Adam Street. We're concerned about that. If, if you don't know about the proximity, it's right across the street from Converse Home. Um, and the rooftop, we whenever anybody's on one of the higher levels where there's just a little, little TV porch on the big house next to us, um, when they're up at that level, the noise comes right at us. It's absolutely in our house. And um, so there's no screening at all. So the other piece is that you mentioned that there was you mentioned that there was no that there wasn't going to be lighting on there. I would like to see anybody who's going to have a rooftop deck who is not going to say, oh, we've got a rooftop deck. We're going to put some lights around here. I would. I would do that. But that means that that is going, I mean, that needs to be considered when you're thinking about this because maybe the design is not to include that, but that's going to happen and that is going to impact us. So I would like that to be considered. And I, I love that I think the idea of a rooftop deck is lovely, but I'm not sure that it's appropriate here. Um, the facade is a major difference for that whole community. This is a little little street with lots of sort of old houses on it, um, and I I understand we need housing. This it just doesn't feel like it fits with the, that kind of area. Um, a couple other things. I'm sorry, I know I'm going on. I hope this is okay. That I'm kind of going on and on on this, and I know that I I I'm I'm, I'm kind of passionate about this concept of this building going in, um, it is huge. It's big. And he was saying that the, the, uh, when I read it, it said that, you know, that visually the, the structure of those um, stairs are gonna be visually bigger, but it's really not bigger. Well, it is, it's gonna be bigger with those big staircases. That's, and it's a huge, it's gonna take up the majority of that property and from uh, side to side and also just, it's gonna be big. Um, one thing that I, I'm going to just mention is that we're a community in that area. I mean, this is a really, we're coming into it. This building is coming into a community. The fact that only a few properties were, that we were aware of were notified even of this meeting kind of shows, says, it does, that doesn't acknowledge the fact that this is a city community. I mean, if you go to New York, it, there, with, this is something that uh, is unique. Um, there are those, you know, everybody knows the five sisters, everybody knows, well, we are a community right there. And um, it needs to be, any notification needs to go out to all of us in that area, on Adam Street, up to Winooski Avenue, over to Elm Terrace, maybe even Spruce, because this is going to impact all of us. And it, I, you know, we need to at least have our voices heard. Um, just on that note, there are okay. standards on which properties I understand you know, made on on each, and so okay. um, those were the standards that were followed in this case. I'm sure. I'm sure that that's the. It's just that I feel like there's standards, and then there are, uh, there's just like humanity and kind of looking at what is Burlington. I love Burlington. I am like the biggest. You know, if somebody comes to town, oh yeah, you want this is the place to be. And I'm starting to lose that because I feel like we're not acknowledging or recognizing 
the communities that we have here and, ha and the importance of those in terms of helping them to, to evolve as we need to maybe put in new housing if we, because we obviously need it. I am not an anti-housing person. I am not. I understand that we need it. But I also believe in placing the housing in places that make the most sense and having them fit in with the community to make sure that the community continues to look and have a feel that people want to live in. This is in part the dilemma of the zoning ordinance, mm -hmm. which is this is residential medium density. Mm -hmm. This is not residential low density right here. And so it's, you know, these things come before us. Yeah. And when they're in compliance, we, mm -hmm. you know, we're sort of somewhat hamstring. I know that, you know, I understand what you're saying. Um, I actually used to live next block up on Adam Street mm -hmm. quite, a, quite a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm familiar with the area. Um, you know, I, I think there's ways for people to be good neighbors and ways not to work out. Um, it's not preordained by the size of the building. It's, yeah, by, other things. by understanding the concerns, I, you know, it, it's a dilemma for the for yeah. zoning. Well, I, I think things then that I, I do think in terms of your, I, if I understand correctly, things I do want to look at, is especially if you're going to be having that, the garage down below, making sure that that is not going to increase the runoff even more, that there's not going to be, that we're, um, and the lighting, um, I would love to have the rooftop considered because I do, in terms of how high that actually really does go, because you may not include it, but if it's a rooftop, it is, should be included in the height. Um, and then also the lighting that might be associated with that in the mix. So those are the three things that I feel like I would make, like to have you all consider on this and um, in terms of how that will impact the, you know, that, the, the land and the properties. I think that the, the lighting that was designed for it in the house is it takes that into consideration. You were mostly concerned with maybe once somebody got on the on the deck that was you stringing some extra lights or something like that. But the, the lighting that was there is pretty reasonable now. They said no light that there would not be, but the things they said, I'm sorry, Sean, they um they stated no lighting. And what I wanted to say is that that's not acknowledging what will happen. And I feel like if you're going to build a roof deck, lighting is a part of that. Like you don't put a roof deck up if you're not expecting people to use it. And if they're gonna use it, they're gonna put lights up there. So I feel like it's really in in um I don't feel that that's that's okay. I feel like it, that's sort of like a oh we can sneak that in there thing. And I, I don't think that that's appropriate. I just you've got to acknowledge what's gonna happen. What I would say on the light and on yeah. the noise is there are ordinances in place for that. So that just because we get zoning approval for what is before us today doesn't mean that the health changes that go against the ordinance in the future mm -hmm. and compliance with those ordinances. Here we go. Have you tried? There are multiple with on violations on, on the street already, and they never get to adjust. Yeah. Thanks for the, I mean, you know, I do, I, I'm afraid that that doesn't give me any solace. And, and they think, can, from a design point, I think if you do look at that, is, is that showing me? No, I don't know. But you got, I don't know who else. I have no shot, sorry. Um, or, um, does, am I right that in terms of the, the high, the more elevated that you're going to be getting it? It sort of it seems to decide. Well, always just line of sight. What's that? If you can see it, you can hear it. Okay. All right. Well, then, and that means we will be able to see it. There's no question we'll be able to see it. And it'll be, yeah. So um, those would be design things that come to the rest. Thank you. Um, I, the only, it's not even probably the question for this group, but is this related to the sale of the apartment house next door? That is not in our purview. I just, I mean, it seems coincidental that the big apartment building next door was sold and now this property is available. I was curious about that. Your name and address, sir. 
Pardon? Your name and address? Uh, SC on 18 on Terrace. That's a key you know, I had to I don't have any real major concerns, but I, I reflect what Martha's concerned about. I mean, you know, it's all of a sudden now we're having a structure that's we've been looking at space for a long time. But. I don't have any real major concern at this point, but. Did you want to? Eleanor May, um, 14 on Terrence. Uh, it's big, it's too big. And let's hope whoever this goes through, whoever comes, let's hope they don't have any friends when they drive over their car because they ain't going to park it on Adam Street. It's wall to wall cars, wall to wall. It's a nightmare going up and down Adam Street. So, uh, we're going to have six cars. So let's hope their friends find somewhere else to park. They hide. It was we've got a similarly narrow street, so that's why we're very concerned about this. Is because um, uh, Eleanor's husband fell in the middle of the winter one time, and the emergency the emergency vehicle could not get down the street to him because of the parking. And it's um, that that's I was I'm not a resident parking kind of person, but that's the only time that I that's when I start I asked for that. But Adam, Adams is similar. There's times when you just can't get through, and the cumbersome is right there. You know, they need the emergency vehicles go over there quickly. Now, how how wide is that uh, curb cut for that driveway? Which is that 14. 14. 14. 14. That's a car space. You're losing the whole car space on that side. If you've ever tried to go up Adam Street during the day, there's parking on both sides. So there's what the street is not wide. Two cars to pass each other. So you have to you have to yield who's ever coming down the street or who's ever going up the street. So. Thank you for your comment. Appreciate that. We're going to give the applicants. Is there anybody else? Yeah, yeah, one person on the oh, line. There's uh, Sharon, would you raise your hand right now? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, Sharon, you're now allowed to speak on this. Sharon, we can throw you in. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I looked at this and read the staff comments, and um, my one of the things that they noted was that the size of this structure was significantly increased by the stairwell in the back to access the upper deck. And so I couldn't see if there were internal stairs to get to that rooftop deck. Um, so I had to call and ask, um, I, I spoke with Mary earlier just to find out. And she said, no, there wasn't access inside. And so it made me wonder, um, that's three flights up. Um, and so only young people would really, and I, I'm, I'm talking maybe 50 and under, so I'm older than that. So would really be able to live there and access that deck on a regular basis. Um, and if you were to want to have drinks or food, I don't see people climbing three, three flights of stairs to do that. Um, I see that as, as a barrier and it makes me question why, why the deck is there and why the stairs have to be there. Um, I live in Ward 1 and there's a little side street off of Colchester Avenue called Calarco. And there were townhouses, five of them put in, that were similar, standalone, not connected like these. Um, but they were um, with the garage underneath and residents on the second floor, third floor. So just so you know, um, and you know, I, I was a city councilor, I represented this area for a long time. And so I door knocked and initially some young couples bought those homes. But as their family grew, um, it was hard for a pregnant woman to go up the stairs to get to her first to the 
living room kitchen. And um, as their children were little, it was there was a barrier. Anyways, my point is that what happened to those units for the most part is they became investment properties with lots of young people mainly going to school, living in them because they were the ones who were willing to climb. Now, I don't, um, I know elevators are expensive. I'm just saying that this style of housing has some barriers. And so if we're trying to provide housing for people, I think that this has restricted um, access because not everybody is going to be able to go three flights. Um, and so because of the massing, because of the issues that I've heard from the people who know this site far better than I, um, I wonder if indeed that rooftop deck is, is really that viable. I think that there have been issues pointed out that could make it really problematic for noise and light. And I think access with the stairs, only external access also is another problem, especially if they get wet, it's slippery. I, I just see this as maybe a rethink for the developer to kind of decide, is this really the best use? Can there be a better way to provide amenities for the people that are living in these new houses? Um, I wanted to compliment them on the fact that the roof is white. That's what you're supposed to do because if it's black, it's going to retain heat. And with our climate crisis, white roofs, I guess, are the way to go. So I'm trying to educate myself and learn. But speaking of climate crisis, the fact that um, windows are small and don't really let in that much natural light, I think you know you want to use natural light as much as you can, as opposed to having to generate electricity or use lights. And so I think that as we continue to provide housing, we need to be smart about this. And so I'm hoping that I'm glad windows were added because natural light is really important. It's much healthier for people. Um, then, then um, the light that we gen that we turn on with a switch, and so um, I just feel like I'm glad those those um, windows were added. Um, and my main point is really access to that rooftop deck, the stairs, the massing that it adds and the viability of that, and maybe it is going to be more problematic than beneficial. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me. Sharon, thank you for your comments. I think you missed my cue in the beginning. I just wanted to make sure that I had you sworn in. So can you just swear that the testimony you just gave was true under pain and penalty of perjury? I do. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anyone else? Well, no, I'm wrong. Um, the Alpine factory Sure. Anything else? I think that Karen asked about what the culture is. Those exterior stairs, in fact, are they needed for exiting up the building? Negative. So, the comment actually is begs the question of why not use the interior stairs and not have the expense of those interior stairs. Yeah, I would have loved to. There's, there simply isn't. Um, there, there, it, it, I'd lose a bedroom. I don't know. The same stairs you got. Yeah, but you have to loop around if, if you bring up the plants again. Oh, I see. The stairs down, you, you can't enter on the other side to come back up. Exactly. It's it's so tight. Um, I can't loop around to where the laundry is. Yeah, so the every level of the proposed building accesses the exterior stairs. Ground floor, the first floor, and the second floor. So you could... Uh, circulate all the way up to the top floor interior and just go the last level uh, up to the roof deck. I don't think you can increase the size of building by two feet and get rid of all those stairs. You're trying, to come, you're trying to come in the laundry is really what you're saving. Uh, well, if you can bring up the, uh, 
I mean, it's not for us to design. It just it does seem like it's a lot of construction. I, I would love to avoid that construction. Believe me, uh, maybe one. No. Are, uh, are these uh, only one bedroom units? These are, these are three three bedroom unit. Uh, so the the stairway uh, would actually have to start here. So I'd need three feet. So I I basically I'd I'd lose the the bedroom would be halved here, and it would I'd, I'd need this whole space and three feet and three feet to access it. So that's. There's a stair that goes down, and there'd have to be another one that went up. I'd have to circulate all the way around and back up. So, so we thought that the, the best way to do it would be with an exterior stair. Does that make sense or, or not? Uh, I, to me, it's a lot of a uh, lot of exterior construction, a lot of extra expense for something that maybe there's another solution to it. You know, I mean, you know, it was three feet of of more. Space it's six it's six feet. Uh, so I I I I'd lose that that front that street side bedroom on the on the second floor. Uh, it it wouldn't be a space that was that I maybe I can call it a den, but I'd lose the bedroom. Yeah, it's not a design, but it's there. It was. Uh, Your expense. Uh, yeah, no, I, I would I would love to. Uh, uh, Get rid of that expense. Uh, we we could do a stair that simply went from the top floor up and didn't have all the stairs below. But we thought it would be a nice amenity yeah. to be able to go interior and exterior. Um, but uh, in regards to uh, the comments that our neighbors made, uh, thank you for coming. We, we want to be good neighbors. We want to be uh, a part of the community. Uh, we believe in the community. We live in Burlington. We're, we're part of the Burlington community and understand uh, the issues with housing and the issues with how the community is changing and uh, we are trying to do the right thing by Burlington with this project and part of that is making the project uh, ownership as opposed to rental we thought that would be so you do this is condominiums this is condominiums so this will be three homes that we hope uh, a young family or, or a family will purchase. So, so that that's part of our of uh, our, our thinking and something we're we're very committed to is is, is we understand there's issues around rentals and a, a way to contribute to the community uh, community is through is potentially through ownership. Uh, another way it is uh, we understand in this uh, quasi urban. Uh, environment here, parking is a huge issue, and that's why we wanted to provide uh, garages, get uh, the cars off of the street, because we all, we realize that that is a um, a biased amenity, and, or you know, it's, it's a, something that's in short supply of street parking. So we, we very intentionally wanted to provide off street parking. Uh, in terms of it not being an appropriately sized building, I mean, there is an 11 unit uh, rental building next to it. There's the Congress House uh, across from it. There's a wide variety of, of buildings in the immediate vicinity. There are single family homes and, and sort of everything in between up, up to, uh, you know, larger commercial multifamily buildings. So uh, a three a three unit project, we, we thought, uh, you know, that would be an appropriate scale. Uh, the, the rooftop use, we, we can't mandate how people will uh, will use it. We don't intend to provide uh, electrical up there, so they would have to string all kinds of uh, extension cords up there. We hope owners would be more uh, better neighbors, potentially. You don't have to know that. Um, in terms of the size of the building, as the board said, we are following the ordinance and, and what's allowed. And we also want to provide as much housing as possible, things being as they are. And in regards to the stormwater, uh, as, as was stated by the board, it's sort of the, the idea is that it's a net zero situation and this construction won't change uh, what is happening there and potentially 
make it better somehow. Uh, where all, all the water will be captured on the site and there'll be no uh, other stress on the city system or, or on the streets or on the adjacent homes. And we're going through the whole per mandated permit process. To do You know, it's saying the lighting, and I think we can, if it says permit condition, is that to require that any even temporary lighting meet the dark, dark sky borders, which means that the lights are shielded and pointing down and don't already seen from far and all that. That would be, but I don't know if you can get away with no elements there because you don't want them. I mean, would, the whole point of black and code is not to be running a lot of extension cords. So you <laughs> may want to come out with up there, but, but I think we can. Say the lighting needs to be the dark side of the Is the building sprinkler? Yes, it will be sprinkled. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we will almost certainly deliberate on this. Um, and with that, we'll close the public hearing, and we have one other agenda item. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Perhaps an introduction is appropriate. This is Charles Dillick from the Office of City Planning. We've invited him as he's merely the architect for this overlay district, if not the architect for this overlay district, which has been adopted by City Council. So we've asked for this primer so that we would understand those applications that are now coming in under the SEI. Welcome, Charles. Would you rather share so you can scroll? Uh, on your own? I bet okay. I do a lot. Actually, just let me know then. Okay. Uh, that's that's okay. Um. So yes, Charles Dillard, Office of City Planning. Um. This I've been in Burlington for a little over a year, working for the city since March. I've been working on this since I started. This predates me. The sort of idea of the South End Innovation District came from Plan B to the South End. And um, there was a request from a property owner in the area to sort of look at this a couple of years ago, actually a couple of years ago. Um, and so this process started um, really with pretty firm foundation in Plan B to the South End. Um, of course, as you all know, I do that plan explicitly sort of said housing should not be part of the South End Innovation District. That was 2019. Uh, and then over the course of a couple of years in Burlington, there was clearly a, uh, among many in the community, uh, realization that, that housing is necessary and needed all parts of the city and the mayor issued this 10 point housing plan that included looking into uh, housing in the South End Innovation District. And so that's what this is. So the key questions here are how can these um, you know, sort of mostly vacant or service parking lots be converted into something that is an urban district that combines what plan we do South End all for with the need for housing. So the boundary of the district here is on the right, the orange dash line, essentially from Howard Street in the north to just south of Sears Lane in the south, and then including the Lula property on the lake, but otherwise bounded by the rail uh, corridor, and the barge canal on the west, and Pine Street on the east. You'll notice there's a sort of notch out between Lakes out in Sears Lane, um, where those properties fronting Pine Street are not included in the district. Um, I'm happy to get into why that was, what it is later, or um, 
And I guess I, I have like an abridged, I'll say it's abridged, it's a presentation. Uh, but have a whole lot of other material that I call on to answer questions. Um, will this change the slides too or no? No, just okay. Okay. Um, so there, the image on the left shows the, the SEID uh, within the context of the existing enterprise light manufacturing districts. There was a question to council early on about sort of how much of this district you know is taking up what is now the city's sort of prime uh, industrial zoning district. So that's what this is showing. Uh, you can scroll down. So the zoning amendment is complex. Um, it includes a land use framework and an urban form framework. The land use concept um, simplified, was simplified through the planning commission process primarily. Uh, initially, there was this notion that in order to sort of uh, promote arts and manufacturing uses that there should be this sort of two-tiered uh, framework of non-residential uses that would somehow that would have prioritized uh, those sort of arts and manufacturing uses and the way that it would have done that is create a sort of ratio between those uses and the other uses like so for the example that we always gave is if the developer wants to put 1,000 square feet of restaurant space, they would have had to do a certain amount of space in those other uses. So arts and manufacturing wanted to first do that. At first, it was a one-to-one -one ratio, and then it got paired down to one to two. So 1,000 square foot of res uh, restaurant or something like that would have required 500 square feet of office or art space. But ultimately, the Planning Commission um, recommended to scrap that, and the council sort of agreed. And so the land use concept is simplified. Uh, it includes these sort of categories. So I'm going to gloss over these. So residential uses, for the most part, are permitted. There are some you'll see later on that are not. Uh, dormitories uh, are permitted. There was an amendment, called for an amendment at City Council to prohibit dormitories, but that was not, that did not pass. And so dormitories are permitted. Uh, all these others are uh, the minimum IC standard is 15%. Uh, residential uses are only permitted in new buildings or as additions to existing buildings. So there's not many existing structures and what is the SEID and, and those structures that do exist primarily have office or some sort of manufacturing. The intent here is to sort of conserve those uses. So the Innovation Center is the one building that frequently comes to mind when you think about maybe converting an older manufacturing, now office building into residential. It would probably work from an architectural standpoint to do that, but that would mean the loss of much office space in the South Innovation District. That's not the intent, and so that's where this comes from. Uh, these are, you know, just all parts of the scroll. Um, office uses are permitted. This is part of the question. So, I could, couldn't convert the existing buildings, but they could add buildings. That That's would... right. So, somebody could, yeah, add on to the innovation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, can, you can scroll through this as well. Community uses permitted and welcomed. The, the point here, really, in all of these is that this district is intended to be a fully sort of functional urban district with everything that a resident or an employee might need. Um, not permitted residential uses here. So single families, single detached dwellings are not permitted. Two places are not permitted. Bed and breakfast, community house, all these others are not permitted. This is intended to be a sort of dense district, so that's fine. Uh, heavy manufacturing and some of the uses that sort of traditionally existed in the ELMU are not permitted um, because they're not consistent. It's sort of mesh well with residential uses. Lodging here is the big one that I want to just point out. Uh, throughout the process, lodging was, I think, there, there was a big debate at planning about hotels. 
and they were split on that. They recommended a version of the amendment that would have allowed hotels. Ultimately, the council decided to, the ordinance committee decided to scrap hotels. There was a last minute amendment to, to try and get them back in, but that failed. So hotels are not. So uh, we did a lot of engagement uh, a little over a year ago. We had some community workshops. We got some virtual workshops. Um, we went out to Ward 5 MPA and Ward 5 and we talked to people about the sort of urban form and land use as well. But these are some of the images, you know, we, we shared, and this is sort of represents the vision where, you know, as opposed to downtown where buildings are tend to be shoulder to shoulder and joined up and attached. This district is, the vision here is more a mixture of attached and detached buildings that allows more sort of permeability for air flow or uh, mobility, accessibility through the district in many different ways. So these are just some sort of representative images of what district strives for. So building height is maximum of 85 feet. You can scroll through this one and I will get to height in just a minute. So this is a, a, this is the board that we used at our workshops with virtual and in-person. We were asking people, you know, what do you like? Four-story max, six-story max, eight-story max, or a mix? And that would, would involve some sort of specific map. And, you, and the sort of green circles are like, this is my first priority. Blue was second, yellow is third, and red means like I don't like this idea. And so you can see that a mix of building heights was sort of the clear winner in all of our communication. Uh, you can scroll down. Uh, probably, I, I thought about taking this slide out for you, but I think it's actually relevant for you all. Um, so in the ordinance today, there's actually some language about protecting views of the lake and the mountains from public spaces. Uh, and streets. There was a, there, there was, while there was broad support for all buildings in the, in the public engagement we did in the summer, we went to the planning commission, we actually had a lot of um, members of the public who came specifically from the neighbors of the bill to sort of talk about the loss of the lake views and the mountain views from any of this development. So we lean pretty heavily on this. Um, so it does say to the extent practical, I think. Um, buildings should not obstruct views from those public places. And primarily in this area, that means Callahan Park. There was a lot of discussion about the views of Callahan Park, and in fact, that did make its way into this specific map. So this is the adopted uh, height area map. Red areas allowed eight stories, yellow six stories, and blue is four. So you can see that in Callahan, if you scroll to the next slide, so this is the sort of evolution of that map. Um, and you can see that if you're looking west from Callahan Park and that middle map, and it, you know, there would have been eight stories allowed. But after that discussion, and that was chopped down to six stories. The Innovation Center happens to be about, it's four stories, but it's 65 feet, the tall building, tall floors, and that old manufacturing building. The smokestack is even taller. I think it's about 100 feet or so. Uh, so that's, this is the this high map. That sort of gap south of Lakeside area. That's the Shannon Parkway uh, right away. So buildings fronting the parkway will be allowed up to eight stories. And then as you sort of taper down toward the Lakeside and then come toward the Vine Street, I go down. Uh, there were some comments about eight story, six and eight story buildings. We can stay on that. That's like a um, bike. Um, comments about taller buildings not being super conducive to community. And um, I think we always sort of disagreed with that as staff. And I think the council did clearly in their vote. But this is just to show that I think tall buildings, taller buildings, eight story, six story buildings can be clearly be part of a good community. It just all has to do with how the district is uh, You can, these are just some images we use. This is not representative of any development proposal or an endorsement of any development. This is just to show how tall buildings 
would be in the district and how they would sort of fit in with the existing contents. Uh, maximum floor plate of a building is 15,000 square feet. So the Miller Center across the street, Champlain College building is about 14,000. Uh, one lake view uh, over in the waterfront there is about 15,012. So that gives you an idea. 194 St. Paul Street, the new Champlain housing building is about 30,000 square foot. So half that size is the maximum. Um, and the intent there is to create a smaller a collection of smaller buildings rather than large block length buildings that um, not only do they not allow sort of air flow, pedestrian flow through blocks, but in the interior of those buildings, those corridors um, frequently are not the highest quality places to live. Um, they're not really conducive much to creating sort of community. I think the trend generally we're seeing around the world is to try and get, get away from that double corridor. Um, like I said, not really conducive to a lot of good purposes. Uh, the maximum floor plate on floors seven and eight is 10,000 square feet, unless the building is constructed in mass timber. Initially, that, that was also to include, if you know the form code, it has some standards, related standards about um, lead, gold, platinum, and some other sustainability standards. And those were in there initially with the ordinance committee and council decided to get rid of those and just concentrate. This is not a form based code. It's it's, it's like a hybrid. It's it's like a form code light, very light. Well, form based code says, do these things, you're home free. Yeah. Is that this? The checklist? Uh, you can do, you could do, if, if you're asking if I could do an eight story building. I so I'm asking you if the applicant could just go to staff and say, we're meeting all this, you gotta accept the building and that's it. Basically. Will the standards be prescriptive or will there be a trigger to go to do the date? That was never discussed, and I, you know, I think we go to the RD. It's not a form code like the, the downtown. Yeah, I mean, you would see projects coming. Through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I've seen form based code since we have such a small area of it, it at the fringes. It just doesn't seem to work. Yeah, uh, and this is. This district is nothing but a lot of edges, you know, not a lot of middle. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it seems to me it's just, just Oreo and no cream filling. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and apologies, I, in my relative newness to the city, I'm still learning this sort of harmony process. Like most of this looks like it would trigger major impact. Yeah, it would. Yeah. It so would. it would, this it would come to the year. So yeah, you can there. So uh, for the uh, the mass timber, so that means the seven to eight foot uh, story buildings, if they were made of mass timber, they could be fifty thousand square feet all the way all the way to the eighth floor. They wouldn't have to step back. Yeah. So that's fifteen thousand feet. Uh, uh, foot. So that's that's a lot of square feet. Fifteen hundred square Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Well, um, to make the buildings, you know, both livable and community friendly and so on, just have the, the block style, something more like cluster housing where each unit has its own amenity of some sort. That'd be nice to see. Yeah. You mean? Well, you had showed one with there were several uh, balconies and yeah. inset areas and those yeah. types of things. Yeah. Somewhat separate from your neighbor. Yes. Because there's not a lot of public amenity left over this other than going to Callahan Park. Yeah, that's right. So I, th I think later on, if we get into sort of some building block coverage and, and block perimeter things, I can talk about. Um, we'll also say that, you know, this is going to be the zoning for some decades here, and I think it's basically the building code will change perhaps to allow different 
types of buildings and here they're really more conducive to some of that sort of earlier you're like this European image. Um, so building bulk, floor area ratio um, went the base went from 2.25 to 2.5 through the council discussion, and that was mainly upon staff's recommendation. Um, in consideration of right of way dedications, uh, you'll see the blue block printer standard that's required here in just a few slides. And so that's going to require the dedication of public streets. And so that area is actually going to be taken out of the calculation for area ratio purposes. So considering that it's a large amount of land taken out for streets has uh, a lot of modest boost and that they are was reasonable. Um, that goes up to 2.75 when inclusionary zoning is included. So it will functionally be 2.75. Um, however, the recent state home act S100 calls for a density boost, pretty significant density boost. So the FAR could go up to 3.5 um, or an extra floor and an extra floor. Um, if 20% of the units are, uh, so that's that if, if, if a developer does choose to do 20%, then that would be the maximum floor area ratio. And, and I'm sure most of you understand floor area ratio, but many of the public uh, do not. Um, so this is just a sort of diagram from the Lincoln Zone, Julie Campoli, about what FAR is. Um, so. So this is the block perimeter. So a maximum block perimeter of 1,600 feet, meaning no block can have a perimeter larger than 1,600 feet. Now this is just a depiction of how that would work. It's blocks don't necessarily have to be rectilinear, um, but each block must sort of be encircled by any combination of streets and paths, public streets and paths. Um, there, you'll notice uh, it's a sort of later on in the process here, uh, we recommended a staff at rail corridors and natural areas. So in this district, that means mostly the large canal um, should also qualify as encircling block legs. So I'm going to stand up and if people on the internet can't see me, but if, if I have this block, rather than have streets encircling it on all sides or, or combination, this as the rail corridor would count as leg. So it would be one, two, three, four, the rail corridor. And same with the large town. That was, again, to, you know, prevent the need or the construction of perhaps unnecessary streets along the rail corridor or along the large town. So the blue lines there can be, um, Multi-use bike, walk yeah, as well, not car. That's right. Uh, and streets, uh, unofficially, I think DPW is is hoping to see, and this might be codified. Streets in this district have a minimum standard as of the Great Street standards for downtowns. So it's a sixty-six foot right of way with you know a good part of St. Paul Street. So that's essentially the, the minimum standard. It's pretty big scale. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly designed that way. I don't know if St. Paul is more than 66 feet away. I'm not sure. That, I'm not sure. Um, for any paths, the minimum is 15 feet. So that's identical to the bike path. So 11 foot paved surface with a two foot wide shoulder on each side. So that, that will be the minimum. So in theory, you could see some blocks here where there's only that have a street on the outbound side and pass and there's a reason. And who's who's gonna design? Design what? Where the streets are? Where the streets uh, are. developers um, who need to construct these streets to comply with the standard will. Um, we uh, one option would have been to look at the official map and have staff sort of just draw streets on the official map. And Early on, we decided against that. Um, often, a developer and their designers are the ones looking at the site so closely that they can probably figure out where streets should better go. Is that the sort of thing that there's public review for? Public feedback? Yeah. There, there certainly have been 
project reviews that have begged for definition of these corridors. And I'm thinking of the last review we had for the Rail Yard Enterprise District that we're looking at organizing a corridor in a certain direction and it's begging for activation around it. Now blocks are parcels, correct? We're talking about a development area. So the parcels themselves may be irregular or a different size, but the development of the blocks is what is the lead here on the limitation. But it does also concern me as staff that it's almost like first one in, first one gets to decide where those corridors are rather than being given direction or encouragement. Yeah, it um, unofficially encourages, I think, collaborative design. And in fact, the blocks, sure many of you are familiar uh, or know about this, the blocks between Lakeside and Sears Lane are being looked at in a coordinated redevelopment. Um, it's on the city's website. Um, the, the owners of Pula uh, have a development uh, entity who owns 125 Lakeside, which is uh, the north portion, just south of, of Lakeside Avenue. The city owns 68 Sears Lane uh, and Champlain College, obviously that's the property just across the street here. Uh, and the three entities have engaged in an MOU to do some coordinated planning and development that's underway. And the streets are probably one of the primary issues that I think are being discussed and where those streets are gonna be, how they're gonna look, what their function will be, how traffic will work on them. Um, the innovation- that might be open to the public because we certainly had some design advisory board members that were very concerned about the wild west of not having to find circulation patterns. So, and if we're only talking about three players here, the city, uh, Russ Scully, and uh, Champlain College, that really limits an opportunity to examine where those corridors might be. So if those corridors aren't, don't exist, they have to create them. While they're in the process of creating them, they're not in the public right of way. So they're part of what we would be reviewing. Yeah. Because if it's a public right of way, we don't have any review of that. I'm just sort of thinking that through. Yeah. Otherwise, EPW is the one who reviews things in public right of way. So it's sort of a. How it gets cooked. We were doing the. Pit review and part of that was going back to right of way. We were giving it as we can't comment on the public right of way, even though it wasn't public right of way. Well, it was presented as a subdivision where the parcels were going to be transferred to the city. We understood they were going to become yeah. right of way at that time. But it seems to me it's not from there, they were former streets that were becoming streets. I don't know. It just it seems that like a little bit. There's got to be some oversight of what those right of ways yeah, are. Cool. And so, I don't know. The, um, like I said, the minimum standard is the Great Street standards. And there are a specific, there are DBWs actually working on some engineering standards right now that deal with materiality. Well, there's that's the that. engineering standard, and then there's how it works with the fabric of the city. Yeah, that's right. And that's the different things. And is DBW going to be looking at it from the point of view of planning? Yes. Maybe not. Well, they are, I know, through this coordinated development because this is part of the MOU, but in theory, if, this, if that was not the case, I mean, I'm not sure, but it still stands that any streets have to meet that minimum standard in terms of how they're designed. Um, also, you know, how they intersect with other streets and other transportation infrastructure. Um, if, if there's an alternative street design, uh, the city engineer would have to accept it, and then city council would have to adopt it. So I imagine that you all would let's do it pretty soon. Get to the whole final three. Never soon, child. <laughs> <laughs> all right, encouraging the, the elaborate, encouraging elaborate designs is great, but what we end up seeing is 
uh, you know, the architect, you know, the always with budget constraints. Sorry, we, we have to do it this way instead. Yeah. So there's some sort of review, I think, <clears throat> within, within what we have, within the framework you have. Right? Parking. Um, so Plan BTV South End itself calls for a sort of network of shared parking structures, and, and that was something that we've tried to incorporate into this amendment. I can scroll down. Um, structures are permitted. Obviously, I think, you know, most people would love for this to be a car free district, but cars are a reality for us. Uh, and so acknowledging that. And acknowledging also that underground parking could be either geotechnically or and or financially feasible, allowing some parking structures in the district in, in exceedance of the fifteen thousand square foot floor plate might be prudent. So that's what this is: up to one structure on a lot, thirty thousand, sixty thousand square feet, sixty thousand if it contains a transit use, which means bus stop or station. 30,000 square feet of no associated transit use. Uh, you can scroll through. Uh, parking structures have to be screened or wrapped. Uh, surface parking, no more than 25 surface spaces per lot or 15% of the lot's area, whichever is greater is permitted on any one lot. This is to sort of discourage surface parking while also allowing for accessibility and some measure of service lots for Canadians. Um, so that's, there's so that, a bit. That 30,000 square feet is bigger than your block size. I'm just trying to figure out a square uh, 1,500 not, square foot perimeter. It's not it's that. It's that, well, it's the, it's, that's the floor plate. It's not quite okay. bigger than you do the a block size. 400 by 400 by 400, you know, I guess so then. So that's 16,000. Right. Well, um, yes, I think a parking structure of 30,000 square feet is about 125 feet by about 200 something feet. So it would fit within a block. If the blocks are designed a certain way, this is going to, it is parking is on you know, the old wax yeah. dog, and it's going to determine how blocks are defined. It's too big. Yeah, to make an efficient parking structure, a parking structure smaller than 30,000 square feet begins to become inefficient, pretty costly. And I think 60,000 is actually the city. The reason we reached 60,000 is because the, the CCRPC multimodal transit center study that was produced last year looked at structures about 60,000 square foot in four plate. It's extremely inefficient, obviously. In a, extremely efficient, obviously not great urbanism, but again, reality today is probably the most efficient way to park in cars. And the majority of this district is surface parking right now. Today, it's, right. yeah. So I think that's something you also might see is that as some of these larger lots are developed, the developers may sort of look to use the existing surface parking as sort of a parking bank, use that surface parking as parking for their, until they sort of build out the site that was like maybe they need to construct a structure. Uh, 20% of any lot has to be pervious, minimum 25% of that pervious area has to be composed of TPW approved GSI, smart infrastructure. Um, there's an alternative that says if uh, all of your previous area is composed of GSI, you can reduce your previous to ten percent. Setbacks are zero minimum and maximum twenty. So buildings should be close to the street, but we wanted also to allow some green space, which is courtyards, which are buildings. Uh, blocked frontage, primary and secondary. So again, developers will get to decide which uh, sort of uh, block frontage is which. Uh, so primary frontages will have to have eighty percent of their eighty uh, percent of their sort of length covered by buildings, and uh, seventy percent on secondary. So that's what this diagram is showing. 
ground floor uses uh, are required um, to, to activate the street, but there are uh, some ways to sort of, there is some flexibility on board as you can scroll down here. Uh, 80, again, is uh, uh, ground floor uses, the minimum depth is 25 feet for 80% of all of them and 10 feet for, um, for 20% of them. So 10 feet, you know, might be thinking that's like a workplace uh, space, but actually I think other parts of the world this is really great increases of even spaces two feet deep where maybe a kiosk or a coffee shop produce seller and nobody reads. I still do. That's <laughs> the kind of thing that you might see in a very small space. Um, these are concepts that typically this board wouldn't see because these are checklist items in the form code. So the yeah. depth of the finished area on okay. the first space, they would never see okay. this. This will be new. Okay. Um, so you can scroll down here. Um, there are ways to reduce your required ground floor uses, non-residential uses. So one is to do, if you stop uh, here, um, oh, next one down. Um, you can sort of reduce on a one to one basis your required ground floor non residential uses in your first floor if you do um, an, a, an equivalent amount in a detached uh, structure outside of your home. So, think Lunix kiosk or these sort of shipping containers. So, it's just a, you know, there's acknowledgement that there's a sort of club of vacant. Space all over the country, Burlington, uh, in new mixed use development. This was a way to think about well, what's a, a feasible way to get non residential uses in a way that might be more flexible or more important and would also um, activate the public. Realm. You can scroll through this. And one. so, in this image, for example, that um, yeah. that kiosk located on that green space is yeah. that public space? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it could be in a courtyard next to the building or well, right now the public space doesn't really exist anywhere. No, there's no public space there. Yeah. Yeah. It, right. it, it would behoove, yeah, I think it, it behooves developers to think about maintenance in a public in order to sort of open up these possibilities. Um, these next three can reduce the amount of ground floor residential and non-residential use by in 15% increments. So affordable commercial space, uh, accessible, publicly accessible open space, and family-sized units in the building. So a minimum of two and three bedroom units. Uh, ground floor entries every 62 feet. It's probably supporting there. There's well, it's, that's going to be a challenge now. Yeah. I'm so trying nothing, to anticipate it's going through the landscaping. landscaping. So there's nothing about landscaping or you know, yeah, landscaping. Well, it's, uh, it, nothing super prescriptive aside from the previous area. You're talking about the great streets, that's that's talking about trees. And the great street standards have street tree. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but I, you know, I'm just thinking about walkability. Of yeah, the neighborhood that you that gets created. That's not standard. Really, isn't doing anything. That's so the, we we thought a lot about open space and landscape. Um, sensibly, there aren't any specific standards to address it. But with the FAR, with the block perimeter, with the block coverage, it sort of induces the creation of a lot of open space. It's it's pretty tough to develop out these blocks completely in a way that gets you on your 3.5 FAR. I think a 3.5 FAR, which will be the max, I would want to see that, but in modeling the site in many different ways, we always end up with a lot of great I'm confused how the FAR and the front end requirements combine in a way to allow the because you can't actually have eight stories and 80% frontage on one side and 70% on the other. But it seems like we're saying you have to fill a lot, but you also can't fill a lot. You're doing eight stories, 
Am I not understanding that? Well, yeah, I'm probably not. Um, You're saying because of the build out requirement for the frontage. Yeah. How do you get to the FAR? Yeah. But is that is the eighty percent and seventy percent of your total? I guess I'm sorry. Front edge. I guess it'll be a front edge. Yeah, so, that's what I because like the it, diagrams for the front edge versus the diagrams for FAR. I don't understand how you can both of those. It'd be five feet deep. <laughs> you know, so like this image, for example, um, they are meeting the uh, front edge standards here. They're within the heights. The lot coverage definitely meeting that. That doesn't look like that. They are. Do you think that's more three point five? It might be. I'm not sure. But we did. We've modeled this site in the MOU work. Our consultant. We have modeled it. Our consultants have modeled it. Hula teams consultants have modeled it. We all can get to two point five, three point five. Ample open space. It's it's it is complex, and it I probably could have included some other slides that sort of show how it works. But um, it intentionally creates interior courtyards. Is what it does. You have to fill up a certain amount of your your block front edge. Your FAR is what it is, and so that inevitably is going to leave some space between buildings and behind buildings. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, can you get a, yeah, you get space. like looking at, at, um, the bottom right one, yeah, that's, that's what the current, that's what this approach, uh, so, it, yes, but the, these lots, these blocks are very large, you can't do a building, even a quarter of the size of the block. 15,000 square feet is pretty small um, as buildings go. But we're anticipating the current lots being broken up or not necessarily? Uh, the amendment works either way. I think if a, if a block is subdivided into different parcels, it would work. And each parcel has its own building where it can be done um, in a sort of plan unit development fashion. And I should have mentioned that plan unit developments, we did, part of this memo was to allow unions and the ELM, so in the SEID district. So you'll probably see some big master plan that went through. So it's permitted uses and not permitted uses. There's no conditional yeah, uses. Yeah, not yet, yeah, right. No conditional uses. No um, no, hotels were going to have a bit of, but they don't. So it's just one of those things that, you know, it's like you don't have much of a say about how this thing really works when it's just permitted. They just like that building today, you know, follow the regulations and it's what they want free. I guess we'll just have to figure it out. Staff so had lots of questions, definitions for mass timber. Uh, we define we define mass timber. We, we define block. We define a lot of the terms or all of the terms that are new in this district and now define. We didn't include that in this presentation. Not explicit as a form based district. No, it sort of looks like a walks like a duck, talks like a duck. Yes. We didn't want to be as prescriptive as the form based code. We wanted to have some standards. Yeah, there is going to be the, the related MOU work will have some public uh, engagement points specifically on the public infrastructure, so streets. Um, that's not scheduled yet, but it will be in the next few weeks. So, what how close is this thing to existing? The amendment is adopted. So, um, it's so it's there. law now. Yeah. Um, Just have to figure out what it says. What's that? Just have to figure out what it says. We know what it's, it is very complex. If I had, uh, I, with the ordinance committee, we went line by land, line through this thing like three times. Uh, maybe we could do that for another day. Uh, yeah. 
Who's on the ordinance committee? Are you volunteering? No. no. <laughs> the council ordinance committee. Yeah. Yes. Oh. <laughs> So generally speaking, you you're mentioned it would be sort of like form based light. Um, would, they, would they so would give you more flexibility? Yeah. A lot of form based discussions about yeah. Materiality, windows, shadow yeah. buildings, types, that sort of stuff. We didn't get that. I thought that the correct, please, but form based code was like. Literally, the zoning is defined by the form of the building, not use. It's not just checklist. It's prescriptive, the form. Yeah. Well, but even our form I, I don't think there's our form based code downtown is form and still use. There's still use. Yeah, the I don't think there's actually a form based code anywhere that doesn't have land use where there's underlying land use regulations. I came from a place that had a form based code. There were still land use rules for each district. We tried to step as far away as we could from use, but some of the need for addressing it. So by trying not to include use, we included use. But, <laughs> um, but under this, under these regulations, you're going to see a lot more of that detail stuff, which you don't see in the form code because the basis, the, the bulk of the foundational stuff in form code is staff review. Either you meet it or you don't. And then things that come to you are typically only uh, those discretionary review items like alternative materials or additional height. But the bulk of it under form code is us. Not anymore. You find the see and see I read. Any other questions for Charles? We're very grateful, Charles. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is all in the ordinance online now. So you want to hey, spend your evening readings. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And don't be a stranger. Come back. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. That is the end sure. of our. That is the end of our agenda, so we will adjourn to deliberative for our one item.